Hi, I'm Daniel Rogge with Tormach. This will be the fourth video in a series on uh, the IMTS demo that we did this year with the ZA6 robot and the 1500MX making uh, motor mounts for our Micro Arc 6 4th axis. So in this video I'm going to talk to you about LiDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging. We'll talk a little bit about how it works, why we chose that technology, um, the algorithm that we used to find these workpieces on the table, a little bit of a behind the scenes, how the code works, and then what we're doing next. So let's start with what LiDAR is. LiDAR uses a laser, pulses of laser, reflected off of a surface back to a sensor, and that in principle tells you how far away you are from the object. Uh, LiDAR is pretty much everywhere these days. I found out earlier today from the camera person <laughs> that LiDAR is even on iPhones. Uh, so it's used all throughout uh, mapping. Satellites have LiDAR sensors on them that'll do accurate mapping of the Earth's surface. It's used in autonomous vehicles, so those self-driving Teslas and Ubers all have LiDAR. If you have a robot vacuum, odds are it's got a LiDAR sensor just like this one in it. And we're using LiDAR here uh, with the robot to help us find these work pieces. So why did we want a LiDAR sensor? You might remember if you've seen a few of the previous videos we've done on automation, we used a USB camera to grab the work pieces that we used for the automate demo that we went to earlier this year. Um, LiDAR has some advantages over that camera. Uh, three big things in my mind make LiDAR a better option for us. One, we get information about the Z height of the object, which means we can stack multiple objects together before we grab them. A limitation of the camera is it really, it can find something in X, Y, it's gonna have a hard time figuring out where it is in Z. And LiDAR gives us the ability to stack multiple work pieces. Second thing is the, um, the USB camera worked most of the time, but if you got into some weird conditions, uh, some weird lighting conditions, it would fail. And so if you didn't have quite enough light, or if you had some bright sunlight coming in through a window, it was not 100% reliable. Um, we felt like that was a pretty big limitation. We want this to be 100% reliable, so adding an inexpensive LiDAR sensor on there seemed like it was worth it. The last thing we haven't done anything with, but it is a future area for us to do some research, which is we can use that same LiDAR sensor to map the environment around the robot, for instance, it could help us localize the milling machine. It could help us figure out where the vice is in the milling machine. Um, it could help create a collision scene if there's a wall or anything else in, in the robot's reach. We might be able to automatically map the robot's environment to make programming the robot easier for people. So that's why we chose to move from the camera to the LiDAR sensor. Now let's talk a little bit about how the algorithm works. So in this particular LiDAR sensor, we have a laser source, which generates a line of laser light. Think like a laser level, which would generate a line, same idea. And then we have two detectors here, two sensors. You can almost see them here. They look like little eyeballs. And so those two sensors, uh, they're separated a little bit, which gives us a nice field of view and also helps minimize distortion. If we just had a fisheye sensor that had a big field of view, we'd get some distortion from that. We're trying to minimize distortion, as you'll see later on in this video. So we've got a laser line generator and two sensors. That line gets reflected. So you can see we've got this same sensor housed here. And that line will be reflected off of the table surface or the objects and bounces back into these two sensors. So you can see here in this image, this is raw point cloud data that came back. You can see the laser lines. And you can also see the two sensors. If you look closely here, the kind of uh, circular swipe lines as we take a swipe with the robot, those are areas of noise or some missing data where those sensors don't overlap. So you'll notice when looking at this data that the, the point cloud coming back is really perfect. There are always a few outliers, some noise, maybe some missing data. And that's one of the challenges here, filtering out the noise so that we get a good point cloud from which we can infer the geometry and the location of the object. So how do we do that? 
So we start out by taking a global scan of the area here, and you'll see what's happening is we've activated the LiDAR sensor, and we've decided to move J1, that's the first joint, while keeping everything else constant, and that gives us a radial scan. We could have done a regular old rectangular scan. This was just a, an easy way for us to acquire laser data. And what we're doing is acquiring a point cloud. So at the end of these three passes, we're going to see a point cloud of data. First thing we need to do with this data is filter out outliers. So an outlier is something that's clearly incorrect. Um, might be from noise, might be from stray reflection of some other light, but we need to get rid of those outliers from the scan. We do this based on the z-height of the stack. We know that anything significantly above or below that z-height is probably an outlier. We're really just looking for stuff that's at the top level of that second workpiece, as you're seeing it here in this video. We also filter out things using what we call a nearest neighbor search. So if there's something that looks wildly inappropriate because it doesn't have close neighbors, we filter that out as well. We take that point cloud and then we cluster the point cloud based on point to point distance. And for each cluster, we define something called a convex hull. Convex hull is just a fancy way of saying we create a polygon that contains all the points, right? Easy for a kid to take a look at the point cloud and draw a line around what looks like a shape. That's essentially what we're doing. We just have to use some fancy math to do it. In fact, when you see the robot pause after each one of these little LiDAR scans, you see it pause to, to uh, think about something before it grabs to move um, an object. That's exactly what it's doing, is it's creating that convex hull. From that convex hull, what we do next is determine the orientation and the geometry center of that shape, right? That's going to tell us where to position the gripper to grasp it. We perform some safety checks. We would not want to try to pick up an object that's too close to the next stack. We take a look at the gripper finger width. This is part of the program here. And we make sure that we have at least enough distance between the two stacks to grab the object. Then we move on and we do the whole thing over again on a local scan. This time it moves the sensor a little bit slower and with a linear path and that passes through the center of each previously detected object. Basically the same algorithm, but we're doing it a second time uh, to double check our first work and to be a little bit more accurate. That refined position of the model uh, gives us the goal pick pose for the robot. And from there, it's simply a move L command to the appropriate position to grasp the object. You will notice right as it goes down to grasp, it moves slightly below the surface of the object before continuing all the way to the grasping position. And we do that because we're performing a torque check move, basically looking for a collision. If a collision were to be found, we would back off and alert the operator that something had gone wrong. We don't see collisions regularly, but this helps us avert major crashes if there were to be an error in the detection scheme. Now that we've covered what LiDAR is, why we chose it, and how all this works uh, in this system, I want to talk a little bit about what's next for Tormach. We got all this stuff ready to take this demonstration to IMTS, and really for us it was a proof of concept, and it worked remarkably well. So what we need to do next is everything that you've been seeing so far has just been hard-coded into the robot program that we brought as the IMTS demo. We need to abstract that out and make sure that it works for work pieces of different size. We need to create uh, Tormach robot programming language commands that users can use to do things like set work piece size, uh, set the grasping orientation, set the depth of the torque check move. We're going to write um, a number of commands in the Tormach robot programming language. Most users will only use a handful of them, things like set the workpiece dimensions, set the gripper finger width, and then call a method like find and grasp object that will go grab the next thing it sees on the table. Um, so that's what we think of as a really high level API. We're also going to write a bunch of lower level commands that allow advanced users or people with some oddball specific requirements to do basically anything that we've been able to do uh, with access to the code. So next for us is to generalize what we took here to a place where it is 
documented, released, and ready to use by our customers. After that, we'll create a conversational page in the user interface that allows people to write programs like the one we took to IMTS, uh, write the LiDAR grasping portion of that program without having to type anything in. It should just be a, I'm going to DRO for my X dimension, DRO for my Y dimension, uh, stuff like that. So that should, that should make this significantly easier to use. The whole reason we're doing this is to try to make automation more accessible for people. This robot could easily pick from a grid of parts. The, the challenge there is that you need to make a grid for different part sizes. And uh, it increasingly, um, it's, a, it's a big barrier if you're only making a handful of things to have to make a new grid for every part size you're doing. Uh, furthermore, there are some user interface challenges that come with picking from a grid. What happens if something goes wrong at the fifth grid position and you need to resume the program from the beginning, but at the sixth grid position, now your user interface needs to support that. We just said it, thought it would be tremendously easier if we could have the robot be aware of its surroundings and if it finds a workpiece on the table, it grabs it, puts it in the machine, and then grabs the finished workpiece and puts it away when it's done. That's just one way we're trying to make this easier and more accessible for people. So, if you liked what you saw over the past four videos, please do hop on our user forums. Feel free to ask questions about it. If you already have one of our robots and you're interested in trying out some of this code before we release it to the general public, just let me know in the forums. We always love customers who are interested in beta testing stuff for us, and we would love to have more community participation in this project. Thank you so much for watching this, and have a wonderful rest of your day.